group, uh, which is represented by Claire Camarmetto from the Irish Prison Service. And Claire and her uh, colleagues have been sharing insights on training practices regarding the management of difficult inmates, uh, which is a target group that's been through the uh, food staff skills and competences to the center. So we're very happy to have had this group of experts uh, who have reflected on this topic uh, from various backgrounds and come together to produce some interesting material. Claire, I'll give over to you. Thanks for that, Lizanne. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all. I have to say that when we started this process, it felt like there's a huge amount of work ahead of us um, back in October 2019. And it's so great to be able to sit here with you now sharing the fruits of all of our hard work. Um, I'm just going to share the presentation with you. Now. So yes, as Lizanne said, uh, we've been working um, as the third special interest group uh, looking at the differences and similarities in how we work with a group of people that um, are called difficult inmates. And there's obviously lots of disparity between how different countries um, work with this group of people. And so it's been a really interesting personal learning experience for me, as well as something that's hopefully uh, really useful uh, for countries. Uh, <laughs> who are going to be developing their practices and working with this group in the coming years and months. Um, so just a little introduction to our group. Uh, we have Ms. Uh, Eva Priscalo, who's head of the Department for International Cooperation in Staff Training in the Training Centre of the Croatian Prison System. Uh, she's also a member of the Psychological Crisis Intervention Team in the Croatian Prison System and the Probation Directorate. Um, then we have uh, Cedric, who is quite infamous in EPTA circles, I believe, but in this capacity, he was working as translator uh, for Hugh Beliard, uh, Beliard excuse me. Um, but he was, however, a very valued uh, SIG3 member by the end of our process and uh, has been a really wonderful contributor as well. Hugh Beliard then is a prison service director. He's in charge of training um, departments of the ENAP, so the French National Correctional Administration Academy. He's been working for the French Prison Service for 30 years, including at the head of the National Working Group on the implementation of training programs for the new assigned staff units um, for violent inmates, also called UDV in French. In French. Um, Ari Jams, at the start of the project, he was working with the Estonian Academy of Security Scientists. Uh, sciences and contributed to our best practices uh, document before he left his post actually to go and work with the police service. And then uh, Constantine, Constantine Kazak, who's the Assistant Governor of the National Violence Reduction Unit in Ireland um, and the operational lead of that unit as well. So he was heavily involved in establishing and developing the unit uh, before um, it opened. So the NVRU is our Irish national unit in working with um, difficult inmates or, or violent and disruptive prisoners, as they're called in the Irish Prison Service. And then myself, so a senior psychologist and co-lead of the unit, um, I worked with Constantine uh, to develop and, and shape the delivery of services within the NVRU. Not in this picture, although I know you're all familiar with her, is Lizanne Velt um, and Emma Van Oosten as well, who, despite not being in the picture, organised our work and our chaos so well that we've managed to produce our three documents. And so a big thanks to them for, for all of their help throughout this process. Um, so the group's function, as you know, uh, all of the special interest groups have the same um, outcome. So to deliver the three documents, the first comparing models of practice uh, that are currently employed by European countries. Uh, the second, a document outlining the minimum standards that we believed should apply for training staff to work with difficult inmates. And then the third was a handbook um, and a practical guide outlining how training for staff can be implemented. Um, I think uh, we all felt very passionately about all of the documents, but in particular the third uh, handbook or practical guide. I know from my own experience that having a detailed guideline on how to set up training for staff working with this group would have been a huge help when we were um, delivering the first a round of training to staff in the NVRU and then also revamping that training uh, late last year. 
So similarly to the others, um, we created the documents through two face-to-face -face meetings in March and October um, before COVID hit, and then we've had three virtual meetings since then. One of the really interesting things to me was that um, how much we all had in common, I suppose, with our various ideas. I had come to the group as a psychologist, and as a psychologist, I'm constantly trying to put forward that psychological perspective in an environment where that can be quite challenging to do. Um, but I was really interested in the fact that all the services and all the people around the table had much more in common in terms of our understanding of the importance of getting that balance between psychological and operational uh, perspectives correct, and, and I think that was really positive for me. Um, so the first thing that we had to do um, was to define who are difficult inmates. So the definition that we came up with are that they are um, a particular cohort of people who present serious problems to prison management, prison staff, other prisoners and themselves through repeated violent behaviour. The focus is on those prisoners who display such high levels of violence that require them to be removed from the general population and placed in a more secure location and with higher staffing levels in an effort to address their violent and disruptive behaviour. And I think this was the first and, and probably one of the most important activities of our group was to come up with this definition. Although it didn't take as long as you might think, we all had a, a common idea of who this title might refer to. This group is already a group that's acknowledged in all of our countries as being um, more challenging to manage and more challenging to keep safe. Um, so in the Irish Prison Service, they're called uh, violent or disruptive prisoners. Um, and I suppose it's an interesting one for me as well. Again, as a psychologist, the phrase difficult inmates is not one that I would maybe choose um, by myself. But I really hope that what we've achieved in defining difficult inmates in this way is a commonality of understanding about what it means um, and what cohorts of people in prison we're referring to. And that that commonality is something that can be shared European wide um, uh, to help uh, people to, to understand and work with this group um, more effectively. Um, I suppose violent incidents are considered normal uh, in all of our services from time to time and the criteria that we use to differentiate difficult inmates from other people who behave violently is the level of intervention that's required to manage their violence. Because on a day-to-day on a -day basis, I'm sure you'll all agree, there's different strategies that need to be used in uh, bigger prison populations to help them manage their behaviour and um, to, I suppose, ensure the safe order of the, the prison. Um, but how we define this group was just the level of intervention, the level of management that was required um, to achieve that. Um, so I suppose one of the things that I wanted to do today is to outline what the challenges of working with difficult inmates to help you to understand, um, as I'm sure many of you do already, why documents like these are of such importance. Um, I suppose for the organisation, uh, the challenges that can be presented are decreased safety in the workplace, which leads to increased staff stress and burnout, um, an increased number of staff who are injured through violent incidences. And then both of these factors contribute to increased numbers of staff out on sick leave and the amount of money that's then spent on sick leave payments. Increased resources then also are required to manage the person safely, so maybe additional staff, um, additional numbers of officers during out of cell time. And then there can be lots of time taking up changing in and out of personal protective equipment if it's required in working with people. And so just to give you a kind of um, an understanding of, of what the challenges and how these challenges can manifest in our services are, um, I've produced this little diagram. So we can see that violent in incidences place significant amounts of stress um, on staff and on workplaces and uh, reduced rehabilitation then of offenders occurs um, when we try to manage difficult inmates in a traditional sense without specialist knowledge or training. So the emphasis traditionally is on containment when the person is in prison, which negates our responsibility as prison services to provide rehabilitation to increase community safety when the individual is released. So typically for the individual, if the focus is not on rehabilitation, but on containment of their violence through restriction of movement and increased staffing, the behavioural controls um, can be re-traumatising re for the person. And then this perpetuates the cycle of violence and antisocial or anti-authoritarian behaviours. So ultimately, this decreases safety in the prison as they then traumatise staff through their violence 
and decreases safety in the broader community when the person is released without having completed that work that they need to complete. The other issue is that working with difficult inmates can be extremely challenging for staff on an everyday basis as they're exposed to high levels of, of aggression and antisocial behaviour, even if the outcome isn't a violent offence. And if that goes unidentified, staff then become are more at risk of becoming traumatised and then behaving in inconsistent or reactive ways that then exacerbate their risk of violence, exacerbates the, the prisoner's risk of violence. So specialist training is, is necessary and important because um, it improves uh, our services skills and dynamic risk assessment. I know there was a, a good discussion about that earlier. Um, it improves uh, skills, our services skills in security procedures, so whether they be re relational, physical or procedural security. It improves skills in effective communication and it improves and increases self-awareness and staff support. And so imp improved stress management, as we know, and improved levels of support for staff result in lower sick leave uh, and then lower costs uh, to the organisation. So if we can implement all of these different uh, goals in our training, if we can achieve all of these things, then we can make the environment safer for staff who are working with high risk prisoners. prisoners. We can improve rehabilitation and the opportunities for that. And that ultimately leads to safer communities, which is what we're all here to do, what we're all working for. Um, so just to say a little bit, I suppose, about each of those concepts, um, central to our documents is the concept of dynamic risk assessment. So a form of assessment that takes into account the individual profile of an individual. Um, so perhaps somebody with an experience of physical abuse in childhood. Situations which may, which may trigger their violent behaviour. So maybe physical searches or something like that. And then specific ways of managing that person and those issues in riskier times. Uh, so improved risk awareness and responsive management decreases incidences of violence. And just an example from our unit in Ireland um, uh, to highlight how this works is um, regarding a, a man who has been in prison for killing a family member. Um, his mood drops and violence becomes much more likely to occur around the time of the anniversary of his offence. Um, and then staff are able to be increasingly vigilant and therapeutic services are working with this man in particular to increase his awareness and management of his increased risk around that time. And then in, uh, in enhanced communication skills that our staff have learned uh, enable staff to de-escalate potentially risky situations to prevent violence occurring. Um, so members of staff working with this individual in particular know to avoid mentioning his uh, family member in conversation around the time of the anniversary um, that it, because it causes such a high level of emotional difficulty. And similarly then, um, compassion towards that sensitive time means that those staff whom he's built uh, close working relationships with can have supportive conversations with him, carrying awareness that this is a sensitive, sensitive time for him. And then the whole team can be more aware of the, the higher level of risk around this time and manage it in a way that prevents violent incidences from occurring, as opposed to retrospectively trying to manage his behaviour after something has occurred. So that's just a little example of, of how um, integrated and, and dynamic relational, physical and procedural securities can all work together. Um, so the first document then um, is the cross-European comparison of, of current practices. And so what did we have in common? I thought that was really important to identify. Um, each country, um, interestingly, or, or definitely for me, utilised and emphasised a multidisciplinary team approach to designing and facilitating training. So the disciplines involved varied, but the emphasis was on having a combination of experts within the fields of, of human behaviour, so psychologists, anthropologists and behavioural trainers, and various types of operational and security expertise. All countries had modules that taught staff to understand why an individual might develop violent behaviours rather than to just manage it. And each country also aimed to teach staff to recognise the impact of the work on their own well-being and manage this through staff support services, through supervision or through various debriefing processes. It's important to point out as well that um, in the services that were around the table for our special interest group, we were all at various stages of developing units and services and training. It's not the case that we all had um, the same, I suppose, experiences that there were specialist units 
in each country already. And I think that's really important to point out because obviously resources across uh, European countries um, and across all countries differ vastly. And uh, I wouldn't want people to feel that the only way that they can use this training guide is if they have the capacity and resources to set up a specialist unit. Um, because uh, in reality, these um, skills, these uh, modules can be uh, delivered to wider staff groups as well to help equip them uh, without the necessity of having specialist units uh, that manage difficult inmates. Um, so Croatia didn't have a specialist program or unit established, established just yet, but do build elements of this training into various other specialist trainings. Uh, Ireland and France have established their own units. France has multiple units and in Ireland we have just one and then we both provide specialist training uh, just for staff of these units. Estonia was in the process of developing specialist training as I remember. Um, so just to move on to document two. Uh, so they were the things, just to recap on document one, the things that we had in common were those specific points that I just mentioned. There is of course lots more information in that about the um, specifics of how the multidisciplinary team work together and um, the various different ways in which multidisciplinary team members were selected and modules were decided upon. So the second document then outlined our minimum standards um, of specialist training. So we drew on a number of different sources to devise the minimum standards required for training in regard to the following issues. Uh, so the importance of a good standard of ethical behaviour is emphasised as it underpins the relational approach to security and rehabilitation that we are striving for in producing these documents. Um, so the first point um, is around staff selection and we used the Council of Europe and the UNODC guidelines um, to support our ideas around um, minimum standards of staff selection. So. I suppose broadly that recruitment and selection procedures should be explicit, clear, scrupulously fair and non-discriminatory based on the knowledge, skills and abilities of, of applicants and ensure that only persons with the right qualities are selected to work in prison. Um, and I think that's really important as well because um, I know John mentioned this earlier, but in upholding a really high standard of ethical behaviour um, in our prisons, it ensures that as services we are doing uh, the best job possible, that we're providing the best form of rehabilitation that we can and ensuring that prisons are safe places both for people in prison and also for our staff. Uh, the Council of Europe guidelines recommends that recruitment processes take into account the skills and values required by staff working in a prison context and these values include motivation, flexibility, assertiveness, maturity, capacity for reflection, integrity, teamwork and social and communication skills. So, as I've just mentioned, given the potential for dangerousness of people in prison, the agents who will have to provide care for um, people who are in prison and are violent will have to reconcile the implementation of important and restrictive security measures with the necessary creation of a relationship with the detained persons. And that's what I mean by relational security, because that bond built by the professional communication of the agents or officers themselves despite the challenges and obstacles imposed by a prison environment, uh, will develop um, uh, the relationship to, with the person to such a degree that violent incidences can be um, expected, anticipated and then prevented before they happen. Um, so just moving on to the uh, UNODC documents, they outline how Staff should know and understand how behaviour, communication and interpersonal, interpersonal skills affect an individual. Um, they should be aware of barriers that may interfere with communication and they must also be aware of how their non-verbal behaviour is interpreted during communication with prisoners. So communication, both verbal and non-verbal, is a two-way process um, and the behaviour of prison staff can affect the expectations of individuals and groups both positively and negatively. Um, so there is an emphasis on this training, I suppose, around having minimum standards of what, uh, how good communication looks and ensuring that um, all of the staff who work in our services have a really good understanding of communication and how what they're doing, how their body language, how their verbal um, uh, communication is affecting a potentially risky situation. Um, with regards to staff support, another thing that we believe is, is hugely important 
Um, this can be offered in various different forms as a minimum as a minimum standard. So obviously training, um, supervision, then also um, support, peer support, and then staff rotation as well. So where uh, staff have the opportunity perhaps to move around to different assignments uh, within the unit or prison. And then there's a periodic rotation out of the unit or facility, and that's really to protect staff from the um, the challenge, the long term uh, challenge that can be experienced if you are staying or working in a specialist unit for a number of years. Um, so equality, diversity and inclusion, I think uh, we would hope that these guidelines would be employed automatically. We, we know that I suppose sometimes that's not the case, so it's important that this is included. And Article 14 of the European Convention on Human Rights and uh, Prison Rules suggests that there should be no discrimination on grounds of sex, race, colour, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, association with a national minority, property, birth or other status. So I think that's really important to just include there because as a minimum standard in terms of selecting staff to work in, in uh, units with uh, difficult inmates, that's um, something that's obviously really important. Um, so just moving on then to some of the other points that are addressed in our minimum standards document. Um, we included here uh, trauma-informed custody, so trying to build a model of trauma-informed custody into, um, I suppose, all prisons, but especially uh, it's hugely important in working with um, difficult inmates because so many of them have histories of um, huge trauma. And in I suppose in their behaviour, they can then also um, uh, traumatise staff. So trauma-informed custody is really about um, helping both staff and prisoners to understand the impact that trauma can have on them and on the cycle of violence that can happen in prisons and especially in specialist units. So as part of the training, this is something that we believe should be embedded uh, within that. And there was some debate regarding the ne necessity of including this here with reviewers. Um, or whether it should be something that's included in the best practices guidelines. But we felt um, quite strongly as a group that it should be included here because we should be at least striving for that in our minimum standards. It's something that we should be doing as much as we can to embed um, and not just leaving it as something that is maybe more optional or a best, a best practice. I mean, obviously it's best practice as well, but it really is a foundation for working with difficult inmates in a different way um, that helps reduce uh, the incidence of violent behaviour. Um, so communication and interactions is also something that we included in the minimum standards document. So even if the training covers ethics, values, um, the legal framework and, and mission statements, the care of people, professional relationships and professional practices, it shouldn't be limited to the acquisition of knowledge. Um, it, uh, it's really important that communications and interactions are evaluated on an ongoing basis. So it's not something that people are just learning about and training, but that actually on an ongoing basis, staff are having the opportunity to reflect on their communi on communication and interactions and on how these are affecting the work that they're doing uh, on an everyday basis. Um, we also looked then and, and noted the importance of accreditation of trainers and evaluation of training and assessing participants of training as well. So just to say that personnel delivering prison specific training modules should be qualified and experienced in technical, operational, security, all different facets, I suppose, of multidisciplinary team uh, working and that they should be accredited by either the prison's own training academy or similar international professional bodies. Um, and that prison training academies should ensure that staff who are selected to work with difficult inmates um, are also assessed at the end of training, that it's not a case that they uh, complete training and, um, and that there's no assessment training has been effective. Uh, so we've, um, I suppose, written a little bit about uh, the minimum standards for assessment of participants too. Um, and then finally, the last uh, couple of points are about risk assessment. Uh, so just the importance of using holistic risk assessment and management as a as a minimum standard, that it's not just completed from one facet, um, that it's a, a broad risk assessment uh, procedure that's employed. And then security training as well, uh, the curriculum should be specifically designed to give staff working with this cohort of prisoners the necessary operational knowledge, skills and abilities to 
understand violent behaviour and how to safely then manage difficult inmates. Um, so obviously there's various different types of security again that are addressed in the documents that are really important for the minimum standard. Um, so just to briefly name them, we've obviously talked about physical security, uh, procedural security, um, relational uh, security as well. It's quite complex. I mean, even as I'm talking about this, uh, I suppose I'd encourage you to have a look at the minimum standards um, document just to um, uh, to understand how that's formed the basis then for our best practice guidelines too. There was so much that we could have included. And I think one of the difficulties that we found in producing the minimum standards document is that um, we all have aspirational ideas of what we would like training to look like. And um, it can be um, quite difficult, but also really, really important to define what a minimum standard is. Um, but we did want to, as I'm sure all of the other groups did too, want to respect the fact that just resources are very varied between our countries and that we wanted people to feel like there was always something that they could do with regard to training staff to work um, with this group of prisoners. So document three then is a practical guide to establishing training for staff who work with difficult inmates, so aka our handbook. Um, and so we identified additional components to be incorporated into training with minimum standards. Uh, by jurisdictions that have resources to do so in the following areas. So in staff selection, um, in training objectives, in methodology and in evaluation. I almost feel like this slide should be accompanied by fanfares and trumpets because it does feel, even though it's one slide, um, that there's been a huge amount of work that's gone into the previous uh, documents too. And um, it's great to have reached this point in the process, as I was saying earlier. Uh, so in the area of staff selection, our best practice handbook um, paid attention to additional emphasis um, being on more stringent criteria that can be used to select not just staff, but the best staff for the job from a multidisciplinary perspective. Um, obviously, this is, again, resource dependent. I recognise that some areas and some jurisdictions won't have the luxury of selecting staff. Um, that it will be about allocating staff to work in, in particular units or just hoping that people put their hands up and, and volunteer to do this type of work. Um, but if services have the opportunity to select specific staff, um, then that is a wonderful opportunity and, and something that should be taken advantage of. So where resources allow staff should have completed their basic training as a prison officer, um, they should be mainly motivated with this population because of a genuine wish to help offenders to change their behaviour rather than financial, geographical or other incentives, which may come into play, but the real focus should be on, on being genuinely motivated to work with um, difficult inmates. They should, if at all possible, have completed additional training that demonstrates this, motiva uh, this motivation to work with uh, this group, so maybe additional negotiator or control and restraint training. They should possess values and professional work ethics that support the mission of the organisation. They should demonstrate excellent skills as a team player, possess excellent interpersonal and conflict resolution skills, have a high standard of written and verbal communication skills, demonstrate good emotional intelligence um, skills, so EQ skills, should be physically fit in order to carry out control and restraint duties if required. And staff who demonstrate high levels of interpersonal conflict and poor emotional regulation. So perhaps overt displays of hostility, aggression, cheerfulness, maybe or frustration in their day to day work should be given additional consideration before being selected to work with this population. And it's not to say that staff who have those um, demonstrate those those issues can't work with this population, but just in a, in a and a best practice or from a best practice perspective, it's a very vulnerable group of offenders that we're talking about. And those um, issues among staff can create violent incidences, um, even when that's not meant to happen. So we did also include a section on validating staff suitability using um, potentially psychological or, or other disciplinary assessments. Uh, so uh, examples, some of the examples of assessments that could be used are the uh, NEO personality inventory, um, the coping strategies questionnaire, self-report emotional intelligence test, a team player inventory and a brief resilience scale. And I suppose this is just speaking from my own experience as, as one service um, in smaller units where you have a smaller team, 
the cohesion of that team is of vital importance in the effectiveness of the work that's done. And that piece around staff selection, where it's possible, cannot be underestimated because how the team gets on and how they function has a massive impact on a day-to-day -day basis um, on both the prisoners that are housed in uh, specialist units for difficult inmates and also on the rest of the staff team and how stressful or unstressful their experience of working in an environment like that, which is already stressful enough, um, so how that can be. We're really dependent, I suppose, on our colleagues in smaller units um, than in, in larger services. So then also um, we have outlined some of the best practice uh, approaches to training objectives. Um, so the goal of training should be to develop proficiency in the environment, proficiency in understanding, preventing and managing violent behaviour, uh, recognising levels of risk, uh, increasing competence and security procedures, developing the ability to perform operational tasks, understanding of risk, enhanced ability to work in a team, um, being able to build positive relationships with inmates, being able to adapt and be flexible in an approach, being able to contribute to the design of, of sentence planning, so how somebody on a long-term sentence might spend that sentence, proficiency in collating and sharing information with a multidisciplinary team, um, being able to establish a collaborative approach to doing this work, identifying uh, one's own emotions um, and emotional responses to difficulties or challenges that arise in working with difficult inmates, mastering control and restraint techniques efficiently and effectively, and integrating and being open to new professional knowledge, practices, techniques, and equipment. Um, and so we suggested as the methodology that there should be at least two weeks for uh, those countries that can run uh, specialist training. So two initial weeks and then additional ongoing continuing professional development of uh, about five days a year uh, on, uh, on areas that are identified with staff for their own progression or improvement. Um, and then we've also included a section on evaluation and how um, both the training should be evaluated and also how staff engagement with the training should be evaluated. Um, so just to give you an idea, actually, another thing that's included is two examples. These are not meant to be uh, something that are just taken by another um, jurisdiction and, and used. I mean, you can do if you want, but we've included examples in the document of the French training programme and the Irish training programme as well to show you how all of those training objectives um, can be achieved through specific modules. So um, just to give you a flavour of that, this is the next slide you can see from our Irish Prison Service example. We've divided the modules into an introduction to the unit or service, understanding violence, effective communication, and then risk assessment and risk management. And then from a French perspective, from a French Prison Service perspective, um, they have developed various skill units. So the first is um, understanding institutional framework and procedures of the unit and what that includes, and then managing aggressive or violent behaviour and, and what that includes. So hopefully they're helpful uh, examples for people to have if they're thinking about developing their own training and they can see how it's possible to achieve um, uh, all of the different uh, areas or achieve learning in all of the different areas that I've mentioned in, in quite a short space of time, i.e. over two weeks. Um, so thank you for your attention, and um, I hope that's been helpful. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, I think we now have you, Claire, and also Cedric uh, representing uh, Rick as well to um, answer some questions. Um, perhaps let me start with the first question that I think Cedric, maybe you can share some thoughts on, uh, which is that. Um, if a training academy um, with perhaps limited capacity or resources would be interested to develop a, a training on the topic of managing difficult inmates, what would you suggest that they prioritize? What should they focus on? I'm also very happy if any other of my colleagues from the special interest group uh, would like to uh, jump in and, and answer these questions. but. 
Um, I suppose from my perspective, uh, and again, I recognise that in my role as a psychologist, this may be different from other members of the group. It would be on um, incorporating a multidisciplinary approach into training um, as much as possible. And then uh, I suppose building that model of relational security and, and communication. So helping staff to understand why people become violent and what they can do to prevent that violence from happening rather than just responding in a, in a physical way after the violence has happened. Thank you, Claire. So do you have anything to add to this? Are you there, Cedric? Yeah, just hearing what okay. uh, Shug is saying. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, basically what uh, Claire has already said, but also to understand well the, um, the process of violence, what it entails. Um, also, as Claire said, the uh, intervening as a team, the work, working as a team, uh, in such an environment is uh, is a key issue there. In bonne connaissance de soi et ses émotions. And thirdly, um, knowing yourself well, knowing your emotions, how you are going to react. Uh, in itself, it is work because it doesn't go uh, without searching and without knowing yourself. So that's the third thing. Ça peut... So it's not only about passive security and equipment, um, it's linked to dynamic security, obviously. That, that's for me, of course, for you, yeah. All right. And um, so in your presentation, Claire, you also explained the definition of um, the target group. And I was wondering why you uh, didn't um, choose to include other types of difficult inmates that may not express their behavior or their issues violently, but nevertheless pose specific challenges. Can you say something about that? Sure. Um, I think we all acknowledge that there are various different uh, groups who um, require kind of specialist management within all of our services. But largely, these groups are managed in different ways already. So. I know, um, I'm speaking, I suppose, from my own experience in the Irish Prison Service, that we may have people with um, quite complex mental health problems who require higher levels of management, but then they are managed within a kind of healthcare framework. Um, I know in other countries, it's not so much of an issue for us yet in Ireland, although we're starting to think about how we might respond to groups of people who've been convicted of extremist or terrorist offences. And I know that they are then again the specialist um, training and specialist programs um, being developed to uh, manage a group such as that. One of the areas that I I query myself when it comes to kind of difficult inmates is um, uh, the group of people that would have maybe personality disorder presentations that uh, pre present in different ways. And and I'm not sure that we have co co consistent or coherent responses for that group yet. So they could be, I suppose, included as um, another type of um, inmate who is, is more difficult to manage, and maybe that's something that we need to, to look on or look at in the future. But I suppose by and large, just to summarise that, there is other groups of, of what you might think of as being harder to manage prisoners, but most of those groups are already being managed in, in different ways. Yes, I understand. All right. Um... Nevertheless, I think uh, Cedric and Ruth, can you maybe um, explain that even though those documents are um, targeted at a specific uh, type of uh, inmate, let's say, um, are there any lessons that can be drawn from your uh, that are that can be applied to a wider situation? Okay. Um, Sorry. So um, we focused on violence, uh, and it's also a topic we suggested when we started to uh, to try and have the topics to work on. Uh, and uh, we pushed for for this topic because violence is a, a problem, is the major problem when when we speak about uh, difficult inmates. Uh, 
as far as we are concerned, at least violence is the main issue. Uh, but it's not only about violence, it's all the situation that goes around violence. How do you act? How do you professionally act when there is a situation of violence? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's linked to this topic because it's the priority and uh, it was seen as the priority also by the other uh, members of the group. Um, but it doesn't mean we don't think there are other issues linked to uh, difficult inmates, but it's it's the priority for, for, for the group. All right, thank you very much. Um, and then I think a final question, um, which is uh, that, of course, when you started working on the, this deliverable, the COVID-19 crisis hasn't has started yet, so it's uh, the world looks a little bit different. Um, and I was wondering how the emergence of this crisis has maybe affected also the way that you think about a training on uh, management of inmates. Perhaps, um, Cedric, if you want to start with that. Uh, let, let me ask to Hugh. I have. Uh... No problem. Sarah, but then maybe you can uh, start already while they uh, present. Sure. Um, I suppose it poses significant challenges in a couple of different ways. The first is how is training delivered? Um, and I suppose a lot of, again, in my experience, the effect of training that's delivered is through practice and through either role plays or interactions. And so there is that difficulty in, in how do we ensure that those the training is delivered as effectively as possible when it's happening online. Um, I suppose from a security perspective as well, there's certain things that need to be practiced physically. So how do we make sure that that is also something that's done effectively? Um, and then how do we continue to make sure that there's a really high standard of quality, multidisciplinary work when people are all in different locations? I think that's something and that we emphasize very strongly in our group with the real importance of having that multidisciplinary uh, communication and input into training. So just how do we keep ensuring that that's happening when people can't maybe be in the one place? And technology, I mean, we're lucky to live in an age of technology where we can rely quite heavily on that. And uh, thankfully, that's something that I know we, we have been able to, to do. Um, but it does, I think uh, it's very different um, delivering training from a distance in terms of getting a sense, like I was speaking about the importance of um, staff members, maybe personality attributes or the skills that they bring or the things that maybe they find more challenging. And it can be a harder to get a sense of uh, how people are when you're not really in the room with them. So that's something that I suppose we just need to navigate over the future, um, over the future months as we all get used to a different way of working. All right, thank you, Claire. Cedric? Um, uh, Claire has said a lot, though I couldn't hear because I was talking with you at the same time. But uh, basically, we try to focus um, the procedures on, on communication because uh, the families uh, couldn't attend, they couldn't uh, benefit from the visiting rooms. And there was a big effort on communicating with the inmates and with the families on why and what are the procedures. And also because the inmates, they hear the media, they see on television what's happening. And um, given their, um, um, their difficulty and uh, the status they have, uh, it's all the more important to communicate well with them um, and to reassure them on the procedures in place, uh, what kind of protection they are uh, benefiting from. So um, it's all the more important to them uh, to, to make sure that they are we are sure they are, they are, uh, you know, uh, calm and, uh, but, and we'll talk more maybe tomorrow on the uh, training, you know, the online training and what, how it impacts the training. But basically, basically uh, when it comes to difficult inmates, that's, um, the, the key points, uh, I wanted to, to give. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Uh, tomorrow there will be more, uh, space and more speakers uh, talking about this issue. Uh, in general, so I'm um, really looking forward to that. But thank you for now for your insight. And thank you, Claire, specifically for your presentation as well. It was really insightful. Um, I think that rounds up this session. Uh, as some last words, let me um, 
first of all, thank all of the EFTA members for your attention during this, uh, these presentations. Um, and thank you, uh, all special interest groups, for your hard work over the past month. There's still some to come, but I look forward to uh, sharing the results with everyone. And uh, I think it will, uh, well, I hope, but I think it will prove to be uh, insightful and helpful for other EFTA members as well. Um, also, uh, thank you to, of course, the EU support that made this project and this special interest group activity uh, possible. And a final thank you for the uh, for our Slovakian partners for uh, this first day, which I think was really interesting already, and I look forward to what you have to come tomorrow. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lizan, very much. Uh, thanks for moderation of this part. Uh, however, I, I have uh, maybe one or two additional questions to uh, presented materials and, and outputs. Uh, maybe um, coming back to the process of development. Do I remember correctly that it should be finished uh, by the end of December 2020? That's my first question. And then um, next question. Uh, what are the, the following steps? Uh, how the materials will be distributed, uh, where and how they will be available? Thank you for the question. That's really important indeed. So yes, the uh, documents will be finished at the end of the year, so December uh, 2020. Um, they will be translated and then published uh, through the EFTA website. So we make sure that all EFTA members will have uh, access to this and Yes, they can hopefully use this uh, in practice as well. Okay, thank you. And are there any like pilot trainings uh, scheduled, or um, is it up to the EFTA com community to uh, ask for feedback, or how this is going to be held? There are no specific uh, pilot uh, projects that are directly related to these documents. Uh, they are not in the plans yet, uh, but of course, in the new project uh, that is uh, granted by the EU, uh, which will start uh, next year, uh, there will be more opportunities for exchange. So perhaps there can be uh, in that way a sort of follow-up uh, from the results that we now. Okay.